So we are kind of moving on from our types of reactions and balancing reactions, predicting products category of understanding in this unit. And we're moving now toward how do I quantify the chemicals I need? How do I turn all of this head knowledge of how to do good chemical reactions that obey the law of conservation of mass to, okay, lab, as much as I'd love to say that an investor is like, I'm proud that you know how to make this. Here's my question as an investor, how much is it going to cost me? How much can you produce? It becomes all about the numbers now. So now we're taking a step back from the concept of chemical reactions. And now we're looking into how do I tell an investor, hey man, I need this amount of money to buy this amount of ingredients so I can make you this amount of product that will then make you this amount of money that you can then give back to me, okay? So we're gonna get into that level because again, pretty much any topic in this education system, the idea is that it eventually brings you money, right? Like the idea is that it's valuable enough that we put our money towards it or it can generate a value, okay? That is monetarily recognized. Chemistry is probably the most direct other than business way of talk about a study that brings money pharmaceutical companies, right? Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, all that other stuff. Those labs that made those uh, vaccines rolling in the dough now, right? So chemistry is a really big monetary-based um, subject. I think the value is interesting. The knowledge is valuable no matter what, but eh, you still need to make money off of it, right? It's why people, when they go to college and like, I become a comm major, I'm like, great. How are you going to make money off of that? Like, what is the job that's going to get you that money? right? Marketing person, uh, advertisement person. That's what gets you the money. You study comm, you go into that kind of stuff, right? But in the end, comm alone doesn't help you unless you can use it to get yourself a job that gets you money. Same thing here. So in order to do that, we're going to introduce a new unit. Now for your warm up, I asked you, what was uh, some examples of counter units? And I gave you an example of what's a, of a pair. A pair is a type of counter unit. Um, and what that really means is that it's a unit that we say that represents a number. Can anyone else tell me another counter unit that they've heard? A dozen means 12. What's another one? A double this. Okay, that means two. That's more of a factor unit, but yes. A trio for three. Anybody else? Another counter unit. I even said one out loud. Yes. A singular means one, right? Oh, what does a fathom mean? Whoa, one fathom is six foot. Cool. I like it. Wow, unfathomable. It can't be six feet, could it? Um, that's so cool. Haha. -ha. I'm definitely unfathomable. I am definitely not six foot. Um, okay, what else? A baker's dozen means 13. A quartet means four, right? A few generally means three or more, right? Like, um, what is, uh, let's see. Well, honestly, the term octet is like a counter unit. It means eight, right? Eight in the terms of chemistry, but an octet, right? There's a lot of counter units in the world. I'm gonna introduce now a specifically chemistry counter unit. But before I do that, could someone tell me for this reaction, what are the ratios in this reaction? Could you read off this reaction, like a complete sentence and reveal the ratios to me? This is a balanced chemical equation I put on the board. Um, how would we read the ratios based on this balanced chemical reaction? Finish, finish. Three. If I just walked up to you and said three, did that help you at all? No, like three. And then three, what? Three, eight, three, silver. three silver. So for this reaction, I have three silvers and one lithium phosphate producing three lithium and and one silver phosphate that's my balanced chemical reaction 
that's my coefficient. That's me obeying the law of conservation of energy. That's also my ratios between the chemical species. For every three silver solids, I make three lithiums. For every three silver solids, I need to react with one lithium phosphate. For every three silver solids, I make one silver phosphate. And I could do that with every single species partnered with a different one. I could create a bunch of relationships. I could create a bunch of numerical ratios between the two. I could predict if I have three silvers, I will most likely be able to make three lithiums. If I have three silvers, I will most likely be able to make one silver phosphate. Not rocket science here, but what will become interesting is if you can keep this simple concept when we do the math. Keep this concept in mind that this is what the math is really telling us. Okay, when I introduce the math, it's really me just putting a numerical expression to what we just said verbally right now. Okay, so now I want to introduce another thing called uh, a new counter unit. And to do that, I want you all to look at the uh, up here. And I want you to notice something. Uh, what do all of these bottles have in common? Okay, what else? What, what, what else do we have in common here? They're all in glass bottles. Okay, what else? Hint, hint. If I'm talking about a counter unit, it probably has something to do with numbers. Yes. They're all solids. They're all powder. No, just kidding. That's water. That's liquid. So what's the thing in common? Do they all weigh the same? No. They all aren't labeled, okay? They can all do reactions, okay? Um, what else? They look like what? Seasoning. Okay, we're stretching now. So this... <laughs> This is an example of the new unit I want to teach you about, okay? What all of these samples of chemical species have in common is this. They all represent one mole of each species. They all represent a specific amount of each species, a specific particle count known as the mole. It's like saying I have five birds versus five elephants. The number five stays consistent between the two. Oh, thanks, Lachlan. Looking, making it sound real deep. But the mass and the volume changes. It doesn't change the quantity, though, to be consistent between the two. That's what we're going to discover with this new counter unit known as the mole. So observations, what do these chemicals all have in common? They all have one mole. They do not have in common mass. They do not have in common size. They do not have in common states of matter. They do not have in common, okay, color. But what they do have in common is this thing called the mole, one mole. So the mole is a counter unit and the symbol is MOL. Why we thought deleting the E was going to make that big of a difference, I don't know, but we still did, okay? And the purpose is, is that it is a unit for counting really small things like particles, right? Things like atoms and particles, Okay, it's a unit for counting really small things like atoms and particles. Specifically, it helps us scale up our discussion. So what I mean by that is in the world, we don't encounter one particle at a time. We encounter thousands of particles at a time. Well, I don't wanna have to always say, Hey, could you grab me a glass of six trillion water particles for me? I'm dying of thirst, dying. 
You're like, can I get eight ounces of water? Can I get a cup of water, right? Um, so that's the same concept here is this unit helps us scale up to the macro, to the actual human observable interactable. So I'm not counting one molecule or one atom at a time anymore. Okay, I'm actually turning this into a, this is valuable at the physical level, okay, at the macro level. So how do we know, what is the number that goes with a mole? What does that represent? Because if a dozen represents 12, right? If a dozen represents 12 and a trio represents three, what does a mole represent? A mole represents, okay, Avogadro's number. We have a special name for the number. So what we say is that Avogadro's number is the value of a mole of something. And specifically, it is six, zero, two, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's the number that that represents. So a mole is this number. And that since that number is so awful to read, we have a special name for that number, Avogadro's number. You often will see in chemistry puns, Avogadro and Avogadro as a pun, okay? Uh, it's referencing this number, this critical number that equals a mole. That's a really big number. How would we write this in scientific notation? Bringing back unit one, move the decimal over until I get to here, right? Move the decimal over until I get it between a number between one and 10. And I get that this number in scientific notation is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That is Avogadro's number. That is a mole. 20. But yeah, 20 extra zeros after the two. So as you can see, this number, this counter unit encapsulates a lot of something, which is really helpful when you talk about particles because you are interacting with a lot of particles in a given sample. So in this bottle, there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles of iron oxide. In this bottle, there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles of sodium bicarbonate. In this bottle, there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles of table salt. In this glass tube, there is 6.022 times 10 to 23rd particles of water liquid. In this bottle, there is 6.022 times 10 to 23rd particles of sulfur. All are one mole. I have one mole of everything. So how many puppies are there in one mole of puppies? Yes, thank you, ladies across the room. How many moles of noodles do I have if there are 6.022 times 10 to 23rd noodles in a bowl? One, One mole of noodles. Uh, the old stat was in 2000, uh, like 19, <clears throat> no, maybe like 17, there was like about 7 billion people on the planet. If we had a mole of pennies, 6.022 times 10 to 23rd pennies, and we distributed it out to every single human on the planet, they would get like $103,000. That's how big a mole is. To give every person on the planet $103,000 if I had a mole of pennies. Right. So isn't it so much better than trying to count every particle at a time that you're interacting with at a macroscopic level? That's why we love the mole. And what the mole is gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to describe and quantify chemicals and chemical reactions at a much easier ratio understanding. So before I get fully into the ratios of the mole with your coefficients, 
Let me introduce one little concept with the mole that goes with mass. So right now we previously learned that we can quantify and calculate the mass of a single atom, looking at the periodic table, average atomic mass, and we can calculate the average atomic mass of an entire particle, of a molecule, by adding up the atoms together, right? So molar mass, okay, is basically saying, instead of looking at the mass of individual particle or an in individual atom, I'm looking at the mass of 6.022 times 10 to 23 of those. So what we say is the molar mass is the mass of an atom or particle if there was 6.022 times 10 to the 23 of them present. Okay? So the units for molar mass are grams per mole. Now, just a quick recap, what we've previously done is we've been measuring in atomic mass units. This goes all the way back to unit one, AMU. That's one particle at a time. That's one atom at a time. And now we're looking at what if I have a mole of them? And what that brings us up to is a unit that's really useful in measuring that we can work with, grams. Your macro scale gram unit is only possible to attain through calculating for a mole's worth of something. You cannot get an atom in grams unless you assume you have a mole of it. If you don't have a mole amount scale of that particle or that atom, you're not going to be in grams. You're going to be in some pico something or not straight base unit grams that is actually measurable with a scale. We can't we can't measure picometer grams unless you want to buy like a like a three hundred thousand dollar mass scale and just keep it in your house. Okay, but how are you also going to collect those individual atoms? Like, good luck trying to isolate that. Okay, no amount of tweezers is going to help you. Okay, so it allows us to again take what we know conceptually and bring it up to a workable scale. So connection with the periodic table, how can I find the molar mass of an atom or a particle? So to start with this, what you wanna do is you wanna recognize that the periodic table, okay, gives us a bunch of information, right? You have your, ad, your element, right? Then you have your average mass, and then you have your proton numbers, right? So what we do is what we can do to find the molar mass is you take the average mass that's originally in atomic mass units. You take the average mass that's originally in atomic mass units and you basically keep the number and just change the unit. And you say, oh, well, then it's this in grams per mole. So what's really nice is whatever that number is, it's actually the same value, just a different unit. So it's like saying, instead of saying I'm one, if you like shrunk me down to scale to like Thumbelina size, instead of saying I'm one ounce, I say I'm one pound, you know? It's the, the, the amount of substance at that scale stays consistent. We're just bumping up the scale represented by changing the unit, okay? So what we would see is that, for example, um, carbon has an average has an average atomic mass of twelve point zero one amu for one particle of carbon. For one mole of carbon, it's twelve point zero one grams per mole. So how would we do this with the mass of molecules? Same idea. Let's say I have carbon dioxide. And what I would do to figure out the mass of one particle of carbon dioxide is I would add the mass of each atom. So I have 12.01 plus 16 times two, because I have two oxygens. And that gives me 32 plus 12, which is uh, 46, 44, oh my gosh. 44 AMU for one 
particle of CO2. All I have to do then to figure out the molar mass of CO2 is turn it to 44 grams per mole. For one mole of CO2. For 6.022 times 10 to 23rd particles of CO2. So that's why you guys can actually measure out your substances. It's because you are working at the mole level. And it nicely coincides with the average atomic mass revealed on the periodic table just scaled up. But the value, the number itself stays the same. So um, what this means is this leads us now into our math conversion factors. We're going all the way back to unit one, guys, with unit conversions, because we're going back to how do we calculate, okay? So if I have one mole of gold, let's say, that means I have, according to the periodic table, I look at the atomic mass of gold, and it says it's 197 AMU. So that means it's 197 grams for one mole. And then that means that... I, for a, in 197 grams of gold, I also can say that I have 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms of gold. Well, now I have what we call all of these equivalences. They're all connected. Now I can write a series of conversion factors using this relationship. So I say for every one mole, I have 197 grams. Or for every 197 grams, I have one mole. I could also say, that for every one mole, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Or I could say I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd for every one mole. I could also say that I have 197 grams for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Or I could say for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold, I have 197 grams. Are you catching my drift? Mm -hmm. Unit conversions are coming back in full swing. Where we take these ratios, these relationships of basically equal concepts spoken in different ways. And we use them to convert between species and give us a numerical value that goes with that. So could you try to do the same thing for me right now with salt? Could you fill this in and give me all of the unit conversion factors I could create? So what was the fill in the blank? What'd you write for initially fill in the blank? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. And we're looking at table salt here. So in one mole of table salt, I have 58.4 grams of NaCl. How did I get this? I added Na, which has a molar mass of 22.99. And I added Cl together, which has a molar mass of 35.4-ish. Okay, four or five, okay? And I rounded it together to get this value. Where did I get those values? I just looked on the periodic table and changed the units. Okay, so thank you. Um, why do I have two of them for her? I don't know. Just... Got it. Okay, so hmm, he's a bright mood today. Um, so now what were your ratios? Can someone give me one set, one pair of ratios? Yes. Excellent. Or Excellent. Could someone give me the next kind of set? Aislinn. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me make that look better. Okay, can someone give me the last set? Yes, Hallie. Um, 
Excellent. So now I have three sets, three pairs of equivalence factors that now I can use as a standard for converting between those two units. I can convert between grams and moles. I can convert between moles and atoms or moles and particles, things, right? The counter unit. I can convert between grams and amounts. We're going to be doing that. That is what we're heading into. Long series of unit conversions, converting from one unit to the next to get us to an actual predicted value of how much in grams I can make of something or how much in grams I need of something in order to make what I want. That's what we're headed to. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but if you are someone who loves logical sequence, this is the unit for you. My TAs love this unit because it just becomes about math. It's no longer that much about concept. It's now about, can I get everything to flow and cancel exactly like I, how I want to slash, 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 give me the last unit I want, bam, plug it into a calculator. That's what we're heading into. Now, quick note, you need to memorize Avogadro's number. You need to memorize this number. I am not going to give it to you on a cheat sheet or anything. You need to know the number. It is an important enough number that you're going to memorize it. Okay? So you need to memorize Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to 23rd. It's one number. It is not a state table of anything. It is just a number. Okay? It's kind of like memorizing your student ID. Just do it. So, um, okay. So before I get into molar ratios and stoichiometry, let's take a two minute break. Okay, let's move on and now start pairing this idea of the mole with the ratios, the coefficients that we find through balancing. Now we're taking a step back from molar mass, which is very helpful for us. It gives us a clue into um, how we're gonna use unit conversions again and equivalence factors. Um, but it's only part of what we need to do to answer. The ultimate, ultimate benefit of the mole is that we can now pair it or align it with our coefficients that we determine, the ratio of the species involved in reaction, so that we can not only switch between units, we can now switch between substances and our mathematical processes. So molar ratios are your coefficients. They literally are the coefficients. in a balanced chemical reaction. And what we say is that when we do math, okay, when we do the math with unit conversions and molar ratios, we call it stoichiometry, okay? So stoichiometry is the mathematical process of doing unit conversions with your molar ratios. It's, I call it stoic for short. You're going to become a stoic stoic very soon. Okay. So here's a kind of an example problem of what this really means. So um, when we have this, we would balance this and we would see that it's four, four, and one is our coefficients, our balance coefficients. And what we would say then is, what does this mean? Well, we could say it in multiple ways. We can say it as, you're doing okay? You're getting hot? Yeah. Oh, I was like, are you getting hot flashes or something? You doing okay? Okay. Um, what does this mean? Um, and one way we could say is that for every four carbon atoms, reacts, it reacts with one uh, sulfur particle to produce four carbon sulfide particles. That's how we previously said it, right? But now let's get the mole involved. Now let's get the mole. So no, another way we could put this is that for every four moles, 
here. Let me write this. There we go. For every four moles of carbon, okay, reacted with one mole of sulfur, I make four moles of carbon sulfide. What is four moles of carbon sulfide? Four times 6.022 times 10 to 23. Whatever big butt number that is. Okay. Phone away. So that's what I, that's one way we would translate that balanced chemical reaction to now include the mole. What else could I say? How else could I say this? I could say um, for every four moles of carbon, I need one mole of sulfur. I could also say uh, for every one or here, for every four moles of carbon, I make one or sorry, four moles of carbon sulfide. This is another way to verbally explain the ratio with the moles to connect your balanced chemical coefficients with the concept of this new counter unit, the mole, and reveal how it connects different substances within the same chemical reaction. It allows me to convert between the two because I could say, well, if I have eight moles of carbon, how many moles of sulfur can I get? If I have eight moles of, of carbon, how many moles of sulfur can I get? I just like choked on my own spit, it's fine. Um, according to this ratio, I have eight moles of carbon. How many moles of sulfur can I get? Two, two moles of sulfur. Cause I know for every four moles of carbon, I get one mole of sulfur. So if I start with eight moles of carbon, I get two moles of sulfur. That's essentially what we're going to be doing, but through math, through a mathematical expression. Sounds super easy and it is easy. Don't forget that, it's easy. When I introduce a five-step series of calculations, don't forget, I'm really just doing an easy thing with that. It's really easy, it's just this. Don't forget how easy it is. Don't lose sight of the big idea that's easy, okay? So let's look at an example problem. If I react 2.5 moles of carbon, how many moles of carbon sulfide can you make? So unit conversion, we start with what we know. I'm gonna start with 2.5 moles of carbon. And what then I do is once I'm in moles, this special unit, I can now use the molar ratios of balance reaction. And I can say, well, I know that I'm trying to get to carbon sulfide. This is where I wanna end. I wanna end at carbon sulfide in moles, moles of carbon sulfide. That's where I wanna end, moles of carbon sulfide. So I'm gonna say to myself, okay, well, according to my balanced chemical equation, my ratio between these two chemical species in, a, in accordance to this reaction, I know that for every four carbon sulfides, I need four moles of carbon. And I should actually write out moles so it's even clearer. For every four moles of carbon sulfide I can make, I need four moles of carbon. And remember with unit conversions, you cancel out your old units by having one on top and one on bottom. So my carbons cancel out because really this is like saying over one, right? An invisible one. My moles cancel out, leaving me with moles of 
carbon sulfide, which is exactly what I wanted. And I get a value of 2.5 times four divided by four, which is like saying 2.5 times one. So I get that with 2.5 moles of carbon, I can make 2.5 moles of carbon disulfide. If you're like, I could have done that in my head. You're absolutely right for that problem. For other problems, not so much. But what I'm trying to show you is how simple it is. Don't get let the numbers freak you out. The process stays simple. Cancel out old units. And now we're even treating the chemical substance like a unit itself. We're now even canceling out substances. I didn't just cancel out moles. I canceled out carbon itself. And I got to a different substance, carbon disulfide. Okay. And I love how I wrote, I didn't write disulfide in like any of my descriptions. Wow. Di, disulfide. Okay. Nice. Smooth. Okay. So now the question is, okay, the mole's helpful for getting me between substances, but it doesn't really help me in lab because in the end, we don't report to a lab petition and we're like, hey, here's your six moles of pills they're like oh my god you're trying to kill me okay you're like hey here's like take six grams right so what we do then is the mole is really this special bridge we call it the bridge that allows us to do a lot it's the mechanism it's the machinery that helps us get what we want but the final output the pretty package unit is usually grams so how do we convert between moles and grams Molar mass is a unit that has grams and moles that you can use. So what you do then is you partner all that work I talked about above, and now you use it at the end. Sometimes it's the beginning, sometimes it's the end. And I say, okay, I found that I can make 2.5 moles of carbon disulfide from 2.5 moles of carbon using my molar ratios, using my balanced chemical reaction but I want to report it as a final answer in grams. So what I say then is, okay, and this is like saying over one and invisible one. I say then I'm gonna use my molar mass of carbon disulfide to get to grams. So my molar mass of carbon disulfide is, carbon disulfide is 12 plus 232. So carbon disulfide, is molar mass, mm, equals 12.01 plus 32 times two, which gets me a value of 64 plus 12, 76, okay, for carbon disulfide, grams per mole. So I say then, um, I for every 76 grams of carbon disulfide, I have one mole. Now I put one mole on the bottom because again, I am going to want to cancel out these two units and it leaves me with now 2.5 uh, times 76. And that gives me mathematically, if I were to do the math now in a calculator, I would plug in 2.5 times 76 parentheses divided by one times one. Multiply across top, multiply across bottom, divide. Okay, and it would get me, I don't know what 2.5 is times 76. Does anyone know? Anyone have a calculator? Do Drea's got her phone out. Are you going to calculate that for me, Drea? No, let Drea do it. She's got her phone out. We only use, can't possibly be texting. 2.5 times 76. 190, excellent. 190 grams of carbon disulfide. And that is my final answer. How many grams of carbon disulfide can I make if I have 2.5 moles of carbon? I first figure out using the molar ratios. I first figure out how many moles of carbon disulfide I get. And then I use molar mass to tell me what that means in grams. I have not only converted units, I have switched between substances as well. Very useful. It's kind of like entering different portals of dimensions. Very useful for chemists to be able to talk about different things. Okay. It also shows us why it's so important to have the correct balance equation because this would look very different if you didn't, okay? So 
I'm going to stop there for right now because that's a lot of information. All right. And good work. 